Okay, good morning everyone, good afternoon, good evening, whatever time you're watching this video right now. So, a pleasant day to everyone. So, for today, we will actually be starting our new discussion on hematology. And that will be about intrinsic um, intrinsic and extrinsic defects leading to your increased erythrocyte destruction. So, um, whether it is intrinsic or in extrinsic, or anything that causes your RBC to actually have an increased destruction, we're, we're going to talk about it for today. So, before we start, all right. So before we start, may I remind everybody to please make sure that you have a copy already of the PowerPoint presentation that I have so that as you go along this video for this morning, um, you would be able to follow along our discussion. And by the end of this, um, there will be a sit work which you will be answering um, by the end of today. So I'll be giving you a sit work for hematology for today. So... Before we start again, I just want to greet everybody and I just hope everyone is doing well today. So to start with, let's talk about your um, hemolytic or your hemolysis first. When we talk about increased destruction of your RBC, it can either be in different forms. It can be acute or chronic. It can be inherited or acquired. It can be intrinsic or extrinsic and even ex intravascular or extravascular hemodisease. So, for today, what we're going to talk about, okay, what we're going to talk about is a different classification of anemia. Sir, why do you call it anemia? So, please do remember that when there is hemolysis or increased destruction of your RBC, your your RBCs now, originally, di ba, 120 days yung, yung lifespan ng ating RBC. But because of um, increased destruction of your RBC, they are prematurely lives. Um, they do not even reach 120 days bago sila na de destroy Okay? So we have, uh, we can classify your hemolytic anemia into two. It can either be acute or chronic hemolytic anemia. When we say acute hemolytic anemia, okay, when we say acute hemolytic anemia um, and chronic hemolytic anemia, we're talking about the onset of the disease and the onset of the signs and symptoms. So usually in acute hemolytic anemia, your signs and symptoms, okay, the hemolytic the hemolysis occurs rapidly or um upon exposure to a particular um a particular trigger, a particular substance or a particular condition or environment, your red blood cells now will start to lies. Okay? So agad-agad siya pagka, pagka exposed magkakaroon agad ng hemolysis. Unlike your chronic, your chronic can even be um, undetected at times. Why? Because sometimes your, red, your bone marrow still can compensate to the loss of RBC that is happening. So, lagi namang ganun, di ba? Your bone marrow will try to compensate the loss of your red blood cells through your erythropoiesis. So, until the um, the bone marrow is already overwhelmed by an increased hemoly hemolysis of your RBC, that is the time now, that is the only time lang ka na magkakaroon ka ng anemia or na magiging evident yung anemia mo. So, technically, what happened is that the accumulated or the accumulated burden um, over time in your chronic hemolytic anemia would now present itself as a um, as a condition over time, okay? So, that is acute and chronic. Let's move forward to intrinsic, uh, rather inherited and acquired hemolytic anemia. In your inherited, um, in, in your inherited, uh, in your inherited hemolytic anemia, what happened here is that, what happened in your hemolytic anemia is that inherited hemolytic anemia, what happened is that the factors, okay, that the factors that lead to the, the increased destruction of your RBC are actually within your RBC, okay, or hereditary. So, talagang pagkapanganak mo pa lang, talagang predisposed ka na or predestined ka na into having hemolytic anemia, okay? Unlike kapag acquired yan, if it is acquired upon exposure to a particular substance, upon exposure to a certain condition or environment, 
that is the only time where your RBC would start now to lies. Okay? Unlike kapag inherited or hereditary, talagang meron ng factors, may mga um, factors na within your body, within your RBC, that actually lead to increased destruction of your RBC. Okay? So, moving forward onto that, okay, moving forward, it can also be intrinsic and extrinsic. So, um, intrinsic and extrinsic is somehow similar to inherited and acquired. Most of your intrinsic um, factors that leads to increased RBC destruction are actually inherited. Okay? Kadalasan, yung mga intrinsic are also inherited. What do we mean ba when we say intrinsic? We mean, we say intrinsic since your RBC, the problem is within your RBC. So later on, I'll, we'll try to, I'll try to give you two common, um, common intrinsic, um, intrinsic factors that leads to increased RBC destruction. On the other hand, we also have your extrinsic. Usually, these are acquired conditions. When we say acquired conditions, you are exposed to a particular substance, you're exposed to a particular bacterial or viral infection that will lead now to an increased destruction of your RBC. So meaning to say, um, RBC sa RBC, normal naman yung RBC mo. It's just that your RBC was exposed to certain conditions that will now increase its destruction. Okay? So that is for your intrinsic and your uh, intrinsic. Extrinsic, intrinsic. What about intravascular and your extravascular um, hemolysis? Your intravascular hemolysis is also known as your fragmentation. Um, in your intravascular hemolysis, uh, yung lysis ng cells or ng RBC mo happens in your blood vessels. That's why we call it intravascular. So, intravascular hemolysis can happen due to various um, various condition. It can either be due to um mechanical, um mechanical disruption sa blood sa flow ng blood. It can e even either immunological. So pwedeng immunological. Merong antibodies or mga autoantibodies and even complement activated that cause your RBC to lies. On the other hand, it can also be extravascular. When we say extravascular, it is macrophage mediated, meaning to say it's outside your blood vessel and usually this happen inside your spleen. Okay, It happens inside your spleen. So on your screen right now, you can actually see that your RBCs, okay, your RBC, the, R the RBC destruction can be classified as to extrinsic and intrinsic. And as you can see, most of the extrinsic causes are also the acquired conditions. The intrinsic defects, on the other hand, are usually the hereditary or the inherited conditions. And those that you can see on your screen that are colored red, those are usually chronic by nature. So over time, um, slow phase yung hemolytic anemia na yan. Unlike your Unlike your green ones, these are your acute or episodic hemolysis. So as you can see, bakit natin sinabing episodic? Episodic because um, magkakaroon ka lang ng hemolysis kapag na-expose ka sa certain extrinsic defects or extrinsic or acquired conditions that will lead now to hemolysis. But for today, okay, ladies and gentlemen, let us first discuss the intrinsic and uh, the intrinsic defects leading to increased erythrocyte destruction. And when we're talking about this, there are there are actually two main things that I want you to remember. And these are what? These are RBC membrane abnormalities and RBC enzymopathies. So it can either be problem in two things, the membrane and the enzymes within your RBC. So, sa membrane natin, so matatandaan ninyo, your RBC kasi, your red blood cell, so let's talk about the, the membrane first. Your membrane um, needs to be deformable. So, meaning to say, um, your RBC should have deformability because it will pass through different blood vessels, small blood vessels within your body. 
And dymopathies on the other hand, um because lack of enzyme so lagi 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 kong ni remind before that you have to make sure that the enzymes are also complete because if the enzymes is lacking the product will not be produced and kapag ang product hindi na produce there is now a problem inside your RBC so we'll talk about that in a short while but before that let us now move forward to hereditary RBC membrane abnormalities what are the different abnormalities it can be two, okay? It can either be a mutation that leads to the alteration of your membrane structure and mutation that alter your membrane transport proteins, okay? Your member, membrane transport protein. So, anong pinagkaiba ng dalawa? Yung isa, yung mismong structure ng RBC membrane mo. Pangalawa naman is yung transport protein sa RBC mo. So, this has something to do with the uh, cation exchange, yung mga, pag sinabi natin transport protein, yung nagpapasok labas ng mga molecules in and out of your RBC. But let us first discuss your alteration in the membrane structure. So, before we dig deeper into that, please do remember that there are, when reg with regards to your membrane, RBC membrane structure, there are, transmembrane proteins and cytoskeleton that are responsible in this, okay? That are responsible for this function. And what are those? Okay, what are those? Let's start with the first, let's start with the four proteins that has a significant role in the structure of your red cell cytoskeleton. So we have your spectrin. Your spectrin is a major cytoskeletal protein maintain, that maintains the cell membrane or your red blood cell shape. The biconcave shape is being maintained by your spectrin. On the other hand, we also have here your ankerin. Your ankerin serves as an anchor that as whereby your spectrin molecules will be assembled on the bilip on your lipid bilayer. So what happened here is that your ankerin together with your actin and your band 4.1 all those are your anchors. What do we mean by anchors? Sila yung foundation. Sila yung foundation kung saan mag assemble ang spectrin natin. So kung walang anchorin, walang spectrin. Kasi walang kakapitan or walang anchor na paglalagyan yung ating spectrin. Why do we have color coding? Because your anchorin and your actin... These are transmembrane protein. They are transmembrane protein that are responsible for the vertical interactions on your red blood cell membrane. So what do we mean by that? So look at this picture, everyone. So your transmembrane protein, meaning to say, sila yung parang nakapuncture sa iyong red blood cell, okay? Sa red blood cell membrane mo. So as you can see, we call it vertical because your yung interaction nila is vertical the ankerin and the actin are vertical so vertical yung interactions nila from with one another okay so they maintain the vertical interaction the vertical interaction in your red blood cell prevents the loss of membrane okay prevents the loss of your membrane para itong lock para siyang isang anchor or isang ankla that prevents your ship or your boat your boat from being taken away by your current. Same thing with your anchorin and your actin. They serve as a transmembrane protein that um, that anchors your membrane and prevents its loss over time. Okay, so that is your that is your spectrin, that is your anchorin and your actin. Ano naman ang ganap ni spectrin? If your anchorin and your actin are transmembrane protein responsible for the vertical interaction, your spectrin are cytoskeletal um, protein that maintains your cell shape. And they are responsible now for the lateral or the horizontal interaction. So kung makikita ninyo yung yellow at yung yung red band natin dito. These are your alpha and your beta spectrin. Okay? They, they are responsible in the horizontal, yung pahiga, okay? The lateral interaction on your cell membrane. And what are their function? They function by preventing um, or by maintaining your cell shape, the biconcave cell shape. What happened now 
if there is a problem with these four um, cytoskeletal protein and transmembrane protein. What will happen? What will happen is the most common membrane defect, which we call your hereditary spherocytosis. Your hereditary spherocytosis is the most common membrane defect in which there is an increased permeability to your sodium. Increased permeability to your sodium, which now result to a loss of your membrane. So sabi nga natin kanina, your spectrin, your ankerin, your actin, they all work together to prevent loss of your membrane and to maintain your cell shape. Pero dahil may problema dito, mawawala yung ating membrane. Mawawala yung ating membrane causing now an increased permeability to your sodium. So instead na hindi makakapasok agad si sodium, nakakapasok siya dahil wala na yung iyong mga transmembrane proteins. In addition to that, in addition to that, dahil wala ka na ring membrane, dahil wala ka ng ankerin kung saan doon naka-anchor ang iyong assembled alpha and beta spectrin, what will happen is that the shape will also be lost. That is why in hereditary spherocytosis, you will no longer see RBC that are biconcave in shape, but rather you will see spherocytes that has spherical shape RBC. Okay? Spherical shape RBC. So again, there is a defective binding of spectrin to your protein 4.1 dahil wala ka na ngang anchor to start with. So your hereditary spherocytosis can either be a mutation on either of those cytoskeletal protein and transmembrane proteins that we were discussing a while back. So it can either be an, a mutation in your ANK, um, ANK1, your SPTA1, your SPTB, and your EPB42, which codes for your ankurin, alpha spectrin, beta spectrin, and your protein 4.1 respectively. So what happened during this time is that your RBC now will have an increased um, fragility, okay, an increased fragility, which leads us now to its screening test, with it, which is your auto hemolysis test. Okay, autohemolysis test and a confirmatory test for your hereditary spherocytosis which is osmotic fragility test. So remember, okay, remember that in your RBC originally, kapag exposed ang RBC mo sa isang high photonic solution, it will just swell. But it it, it will just swell. Okay? Um, and that is for normal RBC. But for RBC that has a hereditary spherocytosis, your spherocytes will have an increased osmotic fragility. So ano pong ibig sabihin natin pag increase osmotic fragility? They are more fragile compared to your normal RBC. Okay, so when exposed to a hypotonic solution, automatically kung yung normal hindi pa pumuputok sa pagkakataon na yon, ang mga hereditary spherocytes, ang mga hereditary spherocytosis patients natin, yung kanilang spherocytes will automatically start to lyse upon exposure to a hypotonic solution. So there are also new um aside from increased osmotic fragility, you would also observe numerous uh microspherocytic RBC in your peripheral blood smear. So what do you mean by microspherocytic? Uh microspherocytic so remember nagkaroon na tayo ng loss ng R, ng membrane because of your um ankerin mutation. So dahil doon nawala yung membrane. Lumiliit yung RBC natin. Okay? Pero lumiliit siya, pero hindi hindi pa rin siya by concave shape. That's why we don't call it um, your micro by concave RBC. But rather we call it microspherocytic RBC that are seen in your peripheral blood smear. In addition to that, one, uh, one important thing for you to remember is that in cases of um, hereditary spherocytosis, your MCHC is also increased. So this is a unique feature um, in your hereditary spherocytosis. So, moving forward now, okay, so alam ninyo na ang hereditary spherocytosis may problem tayo sa ating cytoskeletal protein at sa ating transmembrane protein. So, may problem talaga sa ating membrane. Next is your hereditary elliptocytosis. What happened in your hereditary elliptocytosis, ladies and gentlemen, is that there is a defect 
on your membrane why because your rbc na your rbc now will start to become um elliptical by shape they will start to be oblong in shape and what is that uh for what reason that is because of the polarization of your cholesterol at the ends of your cell rather than um around the pallor area so instead na sa pallor area siya nag nag um nag nag concentrate yung cholesterol mo it concentrated itself on the both ends of your rbc so para siyang naging um nag, naging oblong talaga siya so your hereditary elliptocytosis is actually the second most common uh membrane abnormality okay intrinsic membrane abnormality and this is usually present in only 10 to 15 percent cases of anemia so again your hereditary elliptocytosis would um be characterized by 25 percent of elliptocytes in your blood film or your peripheral blood smear okay so that is your hereditary elliptocytosis your arb your cholesterol polarized at the ends of your RBCs. Now we go to hereditary stomatocytosis. Your hereditary stomatocytosis has an abnormal permeability with both your cations. Okay? With both your cations, which are your sodium and your potassium. What happened here? Okay? What happened during... um. Um, stomatocytosis. What happened during um, stomatocytosis or also known as your hereditary hydrocytosis, okay? Your hereditary hydrocytosis is that your RBC membrane is excessively permeable now to your potassium and your sodium. So, because of that, the influx now of your sodium into your cell will now cause loss of of your potassium. So, what happened here is that your RBC now will start to swell. Your RBC will start to swell forming what we call your stomatocytes. Stomatocytes or your mouth cell. Okay? Stomatocytes or your mouth as in bunganga. Okay? Your stomatocytes or your mouth cell. This is actually, and um, the shape is actually like a lip. Para siyang lips. Okay, ganun yung itsura ng RBC natin kapag may stomatocytosis. Although, makikisulat po ako sa inyong mga um, notes right now that stomatocytosis can also be acquired. Stomatocytosis can also be acquired because of acute alcoholism. Okay? Acute alcoholism. So, moving forward, we also have here your hereditary acantocytosis. Your hereditary acantocytosis is due to a beta lipoproteinemia a beta lipoproteinemia so meaning to say the absence now of your serum beta lipoprotein needed for your lipid um transport leads now to the formation of your acanthocytes your acanthocytes are formed due to an increased cholesterol lecithin ratio in the membrane due to abnormal plasma lipid concentration so instead that your your um, instead that your cholesterol is being carried by your LDL or your beta lipoprotein, it is now um, being attached to your RBC. Na-attach sila sa RBC mo, therefore the, RB, the cholesterol lecithin ratio increase, causing now the formation of your um, acanthocytes. Ang acanthocytes mo are like um, pseudopods para siyang mga finger-like projections sa ating RBC. But unlike other, like your Bursel, okay, unlike your Bursel, your acanthocytes, okay, your acanthocytes are all, are actually irregular. Irregular yung projections nila. So what, when I say irregular, hindi pantay-pantay yung mga projections na meron tayo sa um, acanthocytosis. So remember that because there is absence of beta lipoprotein. Yung cholesterol mo dumikit sa RBC at dahil dumikit sa RBC, it can it can now cause your what? It can now cause an increased lecithin to cholesterol to lecithin ratio forming your acanthocytes which are known to be hereditary which are known to be hereditary acanthocytosis. Okay, hereditary acanthocytosis. So Moving forward, siguro magtataka kayo, 
um let's try to differentiate stomatocytosis and um spherocytosis. Spherocytosis increase siya sa permeability ng sodium, pero ang ating stomatocytosis both sodium and potassium. Paghiwalayin din natin si acanthocytosis at si elliptocytosis kasi parehas silang may kinalaman sa kolesterol. Sa elliptocytosis, ang may problema ay yung RBC membrane mo. Okay? Ang may problema si RBC membrane mo. In your hereditary acanthocytosis, ang problema ay dahil walang beta lipoprotein. At dahil walang beta lipoprotein, what happen is the formation of acanthocytosis because your your red blood cells na your red blood cells now are being concentrated with your cholesterol so moving forward so those are the usual intrinsic factors that are um that are related with the cell membrane or the rbc membrane now we go to the different types of intrinsic factors that leads to increase um rbc destruction which are enzymopathies in nature. So the first one is your glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase deficiency. So this is a sex-linked enzyme def defect, which are most common defect in the hexose monophosphate shunt. So pakikitandaan that your glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase is a very, ex a very important enzyme in your hexose monophosphate shunt. Sir, para sa na nga po si hexose monophosphate shunt? Your hexose monophosphate shunt prevents the oxidation of your hemoglobin by your free radicals such as your peroxides. So, dahil nga meron kang hexose monophosphate shunt at dahil meron kang G6PD, napeprevent mo yung denaturation ng ating hemoglobin that will lead to the formation of your Heinz bodies. So, Kapag may G6PD ka naman, okay, may, may glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase ka, walang problema dahil mape-prevent mo yung denaturation ng iyong mga hemoglobin. But what happened in your G6PD deficiency? Deficient ka sa glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase. So what happened is that your hemoglobin will be denatured, forming now your Heinz bodies. Your Heinz bodies are RBC inclusion bodies that are originally a denatured hemoglobin. So, your G6PD deficiency can be seen um, in black people, which are usually mild deficiency lang. In the Orientals or the Asians, usually more severe compared to your black people. The Mediterranean has a more severe um, G6PD deficiency. So again, in your red blood cell, okay, in your red blood cell, in your peripheral blood smear, you can actually see Heinz bodies and you can also see their bite cell. Bakit po nagkaroon ng bite cell? Dahil sa Heinz bodies, your, your RBC with your RBC inclusion, inclusion na Heinz bodies will now pass through your spleen. And we all know that there are two processes that are being done in your spleen. Your splenic pitting and your splenic culling. So, anong nangyari kay Heinz bodies? Yung Heinz bodies ay isang imperfections. At tatandaan, ang, ang, himo, ang ating spleen, papatayin niya, pupuksayin niya lahat ng mapangit, matanda, at mataba. Okay? At dahil ang Heinz bodies is an example of mapangit na, na feature, what will happen is that your RB, your splenic macrophage will pit or will bite your RBC forming now your bite cell. Yung RBC na parang kinagatan, yun yung tinatawag nating mga bite cell. So what will happen to your bite cell? Your bite cell will pass through your blood vessels again, it will... um room around your body until it pass through your spleen again whereby makikita na naman ni spleen na may mapangit, matanda, at mataba in the form of your bite cell and it will now lies your bite cell which we call now your splenic culling. So that is your splenic pitting and splenic culling. C-U-L-L-I-N-G. So that is your splenic pitting and splenic culling. So, Due to the deficiency of or the absence of your glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase, usually wala namang problema. Well, usually it's harmless. Not unless you are exposed to redu reducing and oxidizing compounds such as your primakin, your sulfonamides, your nitrofurans, your sulfones, your analgesics and antipyretics, and your fava B12. 
beans. So if you're exposed to these particular compounds, your hemoglobin will be oxidized. And when it happens, your hemoglobin will denature, forming now your Heinz bodies. Sir, bakit nga po ulit na denature yung hemoglobin ko? Kasi wala kang nag-prevent ng oxidation. Bakit wala kang nag-prevent ng oxidation? Dahil wala ka ng glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase. So moving forward, um, normally in a normal patient we have two var we have two isoenzymes of your G6PD or your glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase. We have your A and B enzymes. So they differ from one another dahil sa electrophoretic mobility. And when it comes to glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase deficiency, there are two um, G6PD that are very much distinct. These are your G6PDA minus, which are electrophoretically similar to your G6PDA. Ang problem lang, hindi siya functional similar to your G6PDA. So, nandun siya, pero wala siyang function. Alam niyo yun, yung parang nandyan siya, pero walang ganap. Okay? Walang gana. Unlike your... And on the other hand, you also have your G6PD Mediterranean. So remember, Mediterranean is the most severe type of glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase deficiency. Um, this time, your G6PD Mediterranean kamukha ni, himog, ni G6PDB. Pero ang problem natin dito, it's also abnormal. So... um. Once that your um, patients, specifically the Mediterraneans that has your glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase deficiency, ingested your fava beans, your hemoglobin will start to denature. And if it start to denature, it will form now your, it will form now your Heinz bodies. And we call that, it's the exposure ng, ng, ating um, fava beans, we call that fabesem. Okay? So, please take note that fabesem is not associated with glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase A- minus only with your G6PD Mediterranean. Okay? Only in your G6PD Mediterranean. So, we're down with the first enzyme deficiency. The next one is your pyruvate kinase deficiency. Your pyruvate kinase deficiency is an autosomal recessive disorder. So the most common enzyme this is the most common enzyme deficiency in the Emden Meyerhoff pathway. Kung si G6PD ay sa hexose monophosphate shunt, si pyruvate kinase naman ay sa Emden Meyerhoff pathway. So why is Emden Meyerhoff pathway important? Because this is the production of your ATP in your RBC dahil nga po wala kang mitochondria dito nakasalalay yung energy production ng iyong RBC. At saan po ba importante ang energy? Energy or your ATP is important in the transport of your cations, your sodium and your potassium, more specifically your cation pumps. Okay? So because that because of the lack of ATP, hindi ngayon gagana yung cation pump mo. At kapag hindi gumana yung cation pump mo, magkakaroon ka ng abnormality in the level of your sodium and your potassium which will now lead to the decreased deformability of your RBC and that decreased deformability in your RBC will now lead to the decreased lifespan of your RBC na kukuha. So dahil walang energy, walang energy, yung cation pumps natin that controls your sodium and potassium levels are also abnormal. And because of that, the RBC will now lose its deformability. It can now it, it can no longer be as flex, be flexible as possible as needed. And that because of that, it will now have sabi nga natin lahat ng mapangit, ma, mataba at matanda, lahat ng may flaws ay ma, magkakaroon ng decreased lifespan. So your um in your pyruvate kinase Deficiency, severe hemolytic anemia, and reticulocytosis and echinocytes are very much evident. Okay? So that is for your pyruvate kinase deficiency. Now let's go to the second to the last one which is your paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobinuria also known as your PNH. What happened in your PNH? PNH is an acquired membrane defect. Okay, it's an acquired membrane defect. So, 
RBC membrane has an increased sensitivity to complement binding. So, review lang tayo ng konti sa inaral natin sa protein. What is the goal of complement again? The goal of complement is to cell lysis. Cell lysis, complement activation. So, anong problema ngayon dito sa paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobinuria? The problem here, guys, is that there is a deficiency in the expression of your glycosyl, phosphatidyl inositol, or your GPI. Your GPI are anchors. Your GPI are also anchors. This GPI are the foundation or the anchors of your CD55 and your CD59. What is CD55 and CD59? Your CD55 is called your DAF or your decay accelerating factor. And your, M your CD59 is your MIRL or your MIRL or your membrane inhibitor of reactive lysis. Okay? Membrane inhibitor of reactive lysis or your MERL. So, your CD55 and your CD59 prevents the activation of your complement in your RBC. Bakit niya pineprevent? Kasi nga ayaw natin mag yung RBC. Kasi pag nag si RBC, magkakaroon ka ng in, um, increased destruction of R your erythrocytes leading to anemia in um, in later time. So what happened in paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobinuria once again is what? What happened in your paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobinuria? Your RBC, okay, lack the expression of your GPI anchors. At dahil wala kang GPI anchors, your CD55 and your CD59 cannot be expressed in your RBC membrane. At anong mangyayari? Kapag wala kang CD55 at CD59, your RBC will be, will be pop. It will be pop and it will now lies. So, your CD55 and your CD59, ladies and gentlemen, are very important um, are very important um, factors or components that will prevent complement activation. At kapag may complement activation, anong mangyayari? Cell lysis. Okay? Cell lysis. So, um, sabihin na natin na your CD55 and your CD59 are like identification cards. So, these are like identification cards na kapag wala kang identification card, you will be eradicated. You will be killed. Okay? You will be destroyed. So, parang ganun lang yan. Okay? Parang ganun lang na, kunwari, may complement dyan sa blood mo. Lumapit sa RBC. Pero nakita na, the act, na inactivate ng CD55 at 59 mo, yung yung complement, walang lysis na mangyayari. Pero ang problema nga sa paroxysmal, nocturnal hemoglobinuria, wala ka ng CD55, wala ka pang CD59. Anong mangyayari? Magkakaroon ka ng cell lysis because of complement activation. And what do we use to detect this um, type of condition? We use your HAMS test and we also do your sugar water test. Your sugar water test, makikisulat po mga kapanalig, your sugar water test is a screening test for your paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobinuria and your HAMS acidified serum test, yun yung mas kompleto niyang pangalan, your HAMS acidified serum test is the confirmatory test for your paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobinuria. Do not worry about the test or the procedure because we will be discussing that next meeting when we go to the hematological procedures that are very important in HEMA1. So, moving forward, okay, let's go to the last intrinsic defect, okay, and we call this your hereditary pyropoikilocytosis. This is a rare disorder accompanied by a severe anemia and extreme poikilocytosis. What is poikilocytosis? Differences in their P, 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 poikilocytosis. That is difference, differences in their shapes. Shapes, P, poikilocytosis. Unlike your anisocytosis, your anisocytosis, S, is differences in their S size. Okay? Anisocytosis, difference in their size Poikilo, poikilocytosis, difference in their shapes, letter P. 
Okay? There is severe poikilocyte, extreme poikilocytosis and red cell thermal sensitivity. What do we mean by red cell thermal sensitivity? Your normal red blood cells will fragment at around 49 degrees centigrade. Okay? In vitro yan, ha? Your RBC will... um will actually fragment at 49 degrees centigrade. But for hereditary pyropoikilocytosis, mas sensitive siya, mga kapatid. Dahil as low as 45 to 46 centigrade, magpa-fragment na ang inyong red blood cells. So that is for your hereditary pyropoikilocytosis. So what we just discussed today are the different intrinsic F F uh, defects that will lead to an increase Destruction of your RBC. So before we proceed with the, the in extrinsic defects leading to increased erythrocyte destruction, let us meditate first, okay? So exhale, everyone. Hold. Okay, inhale. Hold. O, oh, diba? Para lang tayong, ano? Exhale. Hold. And now for one last time. Inhale. Hold. Exhale. Hold. And now, before we proceed to our next topic, so um, we will be discussing the extrinsic defects now leading to an increased erythrocyte destruction, okay? So, what are the different extrinsic defects leading to an increased erythrocyte destruction? So, before we start with this one, so I just want to um, remind everybody that um, all, um, all of the extrinsic factors or immune defects cause anormocytic normochromic anemia. Normal yung RBC. Walang problem sa RBC. The problem is what? All are acquired disorders that cause now an accelerated destruction with reticulocytosis. What do you mean by accelerated destruction of what? Accelerated destruction of your red blood cells. Let us go to the first one, which is your warm Autoimmune hemolytic anemia. So, sabihin, uh, explain ko muna. Pag sinabi natin autoimmune, you produce autoantibodies. What are autoantibodies? Autoantibodies are antibodies that destroy your own. Sinisira niya yung sarili mong katawan. Okay? Yung sarili mong katawan. That is what we mean by auto immune. Ibig sabihin, you produce the autoantibody directed against your body. And that will now lead to hemolytic anemia. Sir, bakit po warm? Hindi ko po maintindihan. Bakit po warm? Warm um, antibody is your immunoglobulin G. Why do we call it warm antibody? Because your immunoglobulin G is most active at 37 degrees Celsius. Makikisulat ako, your immunoglobulin G is most active or most potent at room at body temperature which is 37 degree celsius so what happened here is this your rbc now okay your rbc are coated with your immunoglobulin and your complement leading now to membrane loss and spherocytosis so what happened kasi kapag may immunoglobulin na naka-attach sa rbc mo kahit meron ka pang cd59 at cd55 kikilalanin yan ng complement mo as kalaban. So dahil sa immunoglobulin mo or complement na nakadikit sa RBC mo, magkakaroon ka ngayon ng hemolysis. These are usually common in your CLL or your chronic lymphocytic leukemia, in your lymphoma, and even exposure to some drugs. Okay? So anong nangyari? May antibody. Anong antibody? Warm antibody. Sino si warm antibody? Si IgG. Si IgG nakadikit kay RBC, kaya para siyang nag naging target. Para itong naging target sa, sa RBC na nagsasabi, dahil nga may 
may antibody sa RBC, this is for destruction. Okay? This is for destruction. So, again, that is autoimmune. Meaning to say, ikaw yung nagproduce ng sariling antibody that will destroy yourself. So, that is an immune defect. So, that is your why, ha? Which is your warm, autoimmune, hemolytic anemia. Bakit siya warm? Kasi IgG is most potent or most active at 37 degree Celsius compared to your Kaiha. Si Kaiha is called autoimmune hemolytic anemia. Katulad din siya, tama, katulad din siya ng warm autoantibody. Anong pinagkaiba? Yung isa warm, yung isa cold. Sir, bakit po cold? Nakikita nyo na siguro yung pagkakaiba. That is because of the IgM. The IgM is most potent at 4 degree Celsius or at cold temperature or at refrigerated temperature. So, IgM is most active or most potent at 4 degree Celsius. That's why um, we call it cold autoimmune hemolytic anemia. So, the antibody, is pre uh, the antibody present is usually anti-I. Okay? Anti-I. So, your cold autoimmune hemolytic anemia can be secondary to your mycoplasma pneumonia infection, lymphoma, or infectious mononucleosis, or your IM. Okay? Or your IM. Ano namang nangyayari dito? In cases, take for example na, na napunta ka sa mga cold, cold environment. Napunta ka sa cold environment. Pag nasa cold environment ka, yung IgM mo, didikit na ngayon sa iyong mga RBC. Okay? Didikit na ngayon sa iyong mga RBC. At kapag dumikit si IgM sa iyong RBC, magkakaroon ka rin ng, magkakaroon ka rin ng cell lysis. At dahil sa cell lysis na yan, magkakaroon ka ngayon ng ano, hemolytic anemia at decrease RBC eventually. Okay? So that is your cold um, autoimmune and your warm autoimmune hemolytic anemia. On the other hand, we also have the third one, which is your paroxysmal cold hemoglobinuria or your PCH. Your PCH is characterized by the presence of a biphasic IgG, which is called your donut Landsteiner antibody. Okay? Your donut Landsteiner antibody has a P specificity that fixes complement to RBC in cold temperature. Okay? In cold temperature. And the, uh, that is less than 20 degrees Celsius. So take for example, nasa America ka, nasa Alaska ka, malamig. So ang mangyayari doon, yung IgG mo, sabi nga natin, di ba, originally, your IgG is warm autoantibody. But in this case, because of um, paroxysmal, paroxysmal cold hemoglobinuria, your IgG is biphasic. So what do we mean by biphasic? At cold temperature, dumidikit si IgG mo, your donut, Landsteiner antibody, it will attach itself to your RBC. Okay. So, nandun ka sa malamig, dumikit yung, yung donut Landsteiner antibody mo sa inyong mga RBC. So, sabihin na natin, di ba? In, in the States, ito, in the States, meron silang warmer. Meron silang mga, um, um, what do you call this? Warmer or humidifier. Basta something like that. Okay? That will warm themselves. So, take for example, pumasok ka naman ngayon sa isang temperature na medyo mas mainit. Sabi na natin pa room temperature which is 37 degrees Celsius. What will happen? Dahil dumikit na yung IgG mo doon sa RBC nung nasa malamig ka, ngayong pumasok ka sa isang environment na may 37 degrees Celsius or na warm yung iyong RBC, what will happen is that what? What will happen is that the RBC will now lies the RBC coated with your complement will now start to lies. Sir, bakit po, mag, bakit po ba may complement? Kasi lagi niyong tatandaan kung nasaan yung, yung, yung antibody, doon pupunta rin si complement para i-destroy kung ano mang cell yun. Okay? Kung ano mang cell yun. So, your paroxysmal cold hemoglobinuria is secondary to viral infection. And again, 
it is characterized by the presence of your donut Landsteiner anti body okay so i hope i'm clear so if i'm if you have any questions and clarifications please um do rewind this video for you to understand if not you can have your questions later by the end of our discussion so moving forward aside from why ha kai ha and paroxysmal cold hemoglobinuria we also have your hemolytic transfusion reaction so hemolytic transfusion reaction is due to um ABO incompatibility. So, recipient, okay, yung recipient natin may antibody against your donor. So, take for example, ikaw ay type O. Okay? Ikaw ay type O. Kung type O ka, anong antibody meron ka? Meron kang anti-A at anti-B. Pero ang na-transfuse sa'yo na dugo is type B. So, dahil may anti um, anti B ka, an anti-B antibodies ka, what will happen? It will attack the red blood cells that has your B antigen and it will start to lies. Okay? So, basta incompatible yung dugo na naisalin sa'yo, you call, we call that hemolytic transfusion reaction. Okay? So, for now, I will just be discussing to you ABO incompatibility. But in reality, hindi lang po A, B, um, and each antigen yung ating tinitignan. There are a lot of ant um, antigen in your RBC that needs to be screened, okay? So, in your hemolytic transfusion reaction, yung recipient, yung sinalinan ng dugo, may antibody against dun sa dugo na isinalin sa kanya. So, para ang nangyari dito, kaaway mo yung isinama sa'yo sa isang room. So, anong nangyari? Nag-away kayo at nag Anong nangyari? Na-destroy ninyo yung isa't isa. Okay? So, in hemolytic transfusion reaction, it can trigger your DIC or your disseminated intravascular coagulation which will now release tissue factor and will now start to lyse your red blood cells. Okay? Will start to lyse your red blood cells. That is your hemolytic transfusion reaction due to incompatibility in blood transfusion. Now we're nearing the end. We also have here your HDN, also known as your hemolytic disease of the newborn. Hemolytic disease of the newborn is not because of transfusion, but because of RH or ABO incompatibility. Paano po nagkaroon ng incompatibility? The incompatibility happened between your mother, the pregnant mother, and the fetus or the baby okay the hemolytic disease of the newborn in your rh incompatibility and your abo compatibility incompatibility um please remember that the type of immunoglobulin that is present here is actually your immunoglobulin g and your immunoglobulin g babalikan natin yung lesson natin kahapon sa protein and your immunoglobulin your igg can cross your placenta nakakatawid siya sa iyong placenta and because it can cross your placenta it can affect your fetus so it will bind to your fetal rbc and it will lies sisirain niya yung rbc ng iyong sisirain niya yung rbc ng iyong fetus much of the hemolytic disease of the newborn will it will be further discussed when we go to your blood banking next semester okay so um with everything that I have said, okay, with everything that I have said, we still have a few, um, we still have a few, um, causes of extrinsic, rather, we still have a few, um, extrinsic causes of hemolytic anemia, but already non-immune. So, pag sinabi kong non-immune, wala nang kinalaman si autoantibody, wala nang kinalaman si IgG, IgM, wala nang kinalaman yung ating mga antibodies. Okay, wala nang kinalaman yung ating mga antibodies, but this time it's non-immune but still extrinsic. Meaning to say, ang problema, wala pa rin sa RBC. And the first one here is your MAHA. Okay? Your MAHA. So, all of these are also normocytic, normochromic, ang mga red blood cells natin. But all are also acquired disorder due to intravascular hemolysis with schistocytes. Okay? So, schistocytes or your fragmented RBC. In some, 
um in some resources this is schistocyte schistocytes letter z okay so in maha or in your ma- microangiopathic hemolytic anemia nagkakaroon tayo ng disseminated intravascular coagulation okay intravascular um hemolytic re- uh, uh, intravascular The disseminated intravascular coagulation is example is in your liver disease what happened is that nagkakaroon tayo ng fibrin clot sa blood vessel natin so imagine ninyo para siyang um na, nakapanood na ba kayo ng James Bond movie na kung saan may laser sa pupuntahan mo and you have to pass through that laser laser without touching it kundi makakat or masusugatan ka, or tutunog yung alarm. Parang ganun dun sa microangiopathic hemolytic anemia in the case of your DIC. There are some fibrin clots already on your blood vessel, and when your RBC pass through that, nakakat or nahahate, okay? Nahahate yung ating mga red blood cells, forming now your fragmented RBC, also known as your schistocytes, okay? You can also see that in your in your HUS, specifically in patients, okay, specifically in patients with E. coli infections among children. So, your HUS, okay, your HUS is co- usually, um, it is usually commonly seen, okay, it is commonly seen in your patients with um, E. coli infection. So, aside from that, we also have your, your TTP, okay, your TTP, So in your TTP ganun din yung nangyayari. Okay? Your in your TTP ganun din yung nangyayari. I by the way your HUS is hemolytic uremic syndrome, okay? Hemolytic um hemolytic uremic syndrome. So in your hemolytic uremic syndrome, it that is due to a certain strain of your E. coli or your Escherichia coli that would lead now to your ano, that will lead now to your Uh, what do you call this? That will lead now to your um, that will lead now to maha, which is your um, which is your microangiopathic, ayan, microangiopathic hemolytic anemia. So moving forward, we also have here your TTP. What is your TTP? Makikisulat na lang ako kasi wala dyan. That is your thrombocytic, thrombocytopenic purpura. Okay? Hindi ko tinatawag si Jordan, ha? We are talking about the thrombos- thrombotic, rather, thrombotic, thrombocytopenic purpura. So, this is due to the deficiency of your enzyme, ADAM. That's me. No, no lang, you know. I'm just joking. That's not me. Your ADAM, TS13, that breaks da- that break down your, um, that break down some of your, <clears throat> that break down some of your von Willebrand factor or your 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 von Willebrand factor is a coagulation factor so na-activate nagkakaroon ng coagulation so anong nangyayari pag nagkaroon ng coagulation yung par yung fibrin clot are like thread like na or parang laser like that when your RBC pass through that they will break okay they will be fragmented they will be broken down into tiny pieces. Yes. And now for the last part, we have your March hemoglobinuria. Okay? Your March hemoglobinuria occurs after a bo- the body has a forceful contact with hard surfaces. So take for example for marathon ru- for marathon runners, for tennis player. So these are usually um due to forceful activities or forceful contact with your um forceful contact with um surfaces march hemoglobinuria and the last but not the least we have external other extrinsic factors that lead to increased rbc destruction we have your infectious agent like your plasmodium falciparum even though your plasmodium falciparum are intracellular parasites they are still considered to be extrinsic because they are secondary they are just acquired we can also have mechanical trauma mechanical trauma due to prosthetic heart valve so yung mga rbc mo tumatama doon sa prosthetic heart valve mo nasisira din po sila okay we also have thermal burns like your third degree burns bakit po third degree burns sir so remember that um during burns 
um there is increase uh there is increase um temperature and kapag increase yung temperature anong nangyayari sa protein na denature sila and one thing that will also be denatured is your um hemoglobin and the other protein components of your red blood cells and of course we also have your venoms that are found in your venomous um um venoms that are found in your um snakes and other reptiles and other animals na may venom okay so those are the extrinsic factors so to wrap it up lang no quickly your extrinsic defects can be divided into immune and non-immune defect kapag sinabi nating immune may kinalaman si immune system in the form of your antibodies pag sinabi nating non-immune wala siyang kinalaman sa immune system mo it's really just because of other external things like your coagulation, infection, mechanical um mechanical factors unlike your immune immune um immune defect talagang merong kinalaman yung immune system mo because it's your immune system that initiated the destruction of your RBC so hopefully today you you you've learned what intrinsic and extrinsic defects are so if you do have any questions i will be posting a discussion board on our TLC and at the same time I'll be sending you the copy of this video for you to be able to review this anytime anywhere hindi po to I want TV but thank you so much everyone for listening so this has been your Sir Joms and I if you have any questions I'll be opening the floor for your questions clarifications and any other concerns with regards to our topic for today. Again, thank you so much and have a great day.